I normally wear flip-flops as well, but I was always told when you present, wear shoes. So, um, so we're going to get started. Uh, there's plenty of room in the front seat, front row, for you way in the back. Um, so thanks to all the good folks at Constant Contact for uh, inviting me here. It's awesome to be in Boston and with you all today. It's going to be an awesome day. The keynote I thought was spectacular. Um, I had never heard Michael speak before, but I would welcome the opportunity to hear him speak anytime. In fact, I'd love to bring him to Netflix and have him present there. And speaking of Netflix, are there any Netflix customers in the room? <laughs> Thank you very much. We love you. We love you a lot. Um, so as, as you probably already figured out, I, I do work at Netflix. Um, I run delivery engineering, which is the, uh, we build the infrastructure that all teams at Netflix leverage to do continuous delivery of you know, various pieces of software um, into production. And uh, what I want to talk about today is um, how we do continuous delivery, uh, what we've learned about continuous delivery, and um, you know, the challenges and the results of it, and then where we're, where we're going with continuous delivery. And um, as you're probably aware, Netflix is a global company. Uh, we were, well, over four years ago, be, previous to four years ago, we were a DVD company, if you remember that. And uh, we, we made the decision to go um, to offer streaming video, and that enabled us to go global. And uh, right now, we're, um, we're in 41 countries and, uh, and counting. That number will, uh, will increase very shortly here. Um, we recently announced that we, have, uh, we had exceeded 50 million customers, and uh, that number is obviously still uh, counting. Um, and, and, the, and one thing about the 50 million customers thing is that's, a, that's, that's an account, right? And as many people in the room are probably aware, you can have multiple people view an account. So we, we, we estimate that we have about 200 million people watching various uh, videos. Um, since we're all engineers, I'll talk a little about our architecture. Netflix is a, uh, is a giant SOA. Uh, the, the new term these days is microservices, so you could say that maybe in many ways we kind of spearheaded the whole microservices uh, ecosystem or, or best practices associated with it. Um, most people are aware that we leverage AWS, Amazon Web Services. Uh, I did say we are a global company. We are spread across multiple regions in AWS. And at any given moment, we have um, thousands upon thousands of uh, AWS instances running. And so, you know, why continuous delivery? Um, streaming video isn't terribly difficult. And in fact, you know, Constant Contact could be streaming this now if they wanted to, right? Uh, any one of us can stream video. So uh, the fact that we stream video is not all that, um, th there's a very low barrier to entry to this market, right? So what differentiates Netflix is um, our data. What we collect about what you're watching, um, how often you watch it, uh, what choices you make after you watch that. And then we use that data to figure out what content we should buy, what content we should potentially even produce ourselves, and then um, how, we, you know, how we make recommendations, what shows up in search, and whatnot. So really, we're a data company. Streaming video is, is as we all know, pretty easy. And so because we're a data company, we need to be able to move very quickly, and we need to foster an environment that facilitates that rapid innovation across the globe. And it, it, I thought uh, Michael's talk, uh, his keynote, was fabulous when he talked about some of the, the aspects of you know, volatiles and, and stables and, uh, and speed. And that's, that's a huge uh, concern of Netflix in the sense of we want to move fast because moving fast is a huge competitive advantage. So again, low barrier to entry for anyone to stream video. And as we've already seen it, you've got Hulu. You've got Amazon, you've got HBO. We have a number of competitors. And so what we see is our ability to make decisions based on data and then change the viewing experience for, our, for you, for our customers. If we can do that faster than the Amazons and the HBOs and the Hulus of the world, then we'll stay ahead of them. And the last time, I don't know if people are aware of this, but at peak internet usage times, or peak internet usage, Netflix takes up 33% of the internet. Um, which is just awesome. <laughs> uh, I think it's Hulu, Amazon, and HBO added up are less than 1%. So we're doing a pretty good job. But um, again, as, as the keynoter pointed out, uh, we can't sit still. 
because uh, if we rest on our laurels, we'll, we'll eventually be beaten. So competitive advantage, it's all about speed. And the reason we want speed is so that we can make the viewing experience for you all better. It changes every day. And in fact, we see continuous delivery as the rails, so to speak, to facilitate all of that speed, all of that innovation. So there are teams at Netflix that are deploying multiple times a day. Um, you may not see the changes to your, you know, your home screen or whatever it is, but all the algorithms, all you know, search speed, everything is being changed at any given moment. In fact, I'm willing to bet there's probably a deployment. Well, it's, pre it's pretty early in the Bay Area right now, so there's probably not a deployment going on right now. But by the end of this talk, I'm sure at least one deployment will be, uh, will be executed. So continuous delivery is extremely important to Netflix. Um, we see it as our as it facilitates our competitive advantage to move fast. And I'll get to some details about continuous delivery at Netflix, but in general, continuous delivery, if, if, you, if you want to do continuous delivery, you need three primary kind of facets. And the first one is uh, you need a process that's repeatable. Um, you know, moving from check-in to some environment requires automation. I think we're all engineers, we all know this now. Uh, manual steps are error prone. Um, it's just a non-starter. So, we use, uh, we're, we're, Netflix is primarily a Java shop, uh, and our, our automation is largely driven by Gradle, which is a build system, kind of the next generation. You've got Ant, you've got Maven, you've got this thing called Gradle. Um, so a lot of our automation is spearheaded through Gradle, and then the tools and platforms that my team writes. Next facet for a successful continuous delivery process is it's gotta be reliable. Um, what I mean by this is, implicit in all this is you have to have lots of testing. Uh, if you want to move some piece of code that some developer wrote into production as quick as possible, you need, a, you need some confidence with that. And if there are no tests anywhere, uh, it, it's going to break. It's going to blow up. Um, so when I talk about you know, reliability, it's testing at all levels, whether it be unit testing, integration testing, functional testing. And I'll show you how we do that. But uh, if, if you don't have kind of a testing mantra or philosophy, uh, I, I would start there before you even try to push stuff quickly into production. And then finally, it, it's got to be rapid. I, I said, you know, quickly, right? Uh, processes that take days and days to get something into production uh, are a non-starter. Uh, again, we're all engineers. We're, we're very patient types, aren't we? If I have to wait many, many, many hours to get something in production, I'll, I won't do it. Um, or I'll short circuit it and I'll do something else. I'll just go right to the production machines and make the change there or something like that. So, uh, your continuous delivery process needs to facilitate rapid delivery. Uh, and rapid, obviously, is a, is a very loose term. Um, there are some pipelines at Netflix that do take hours, uh, and I'll get to why they take hours, and, and, and you'll see the, the benefits of that, but uh, you could short circuit those, you know, those particular gates and make it go quickly, but you'll see there's some power of, of going, or some increased confidence through going through these gates. Um, two more things, uh, and these are kind of Netflix specific, but I, I hope that, that you, can, you can learn from these. Um, we, we make two assumptions going forward uh, with respect to continuous delivery. So the, the, the three facets previous to this are a given. They're there. There's two more that um, are kind of, one's cultural, one's technical. And the first one is uh, trust. Uh, at Netflix, we have a uh, firm belief, or our, our mantra is this whole notion of freedom and responsibility. Every team at Netflix is free to do whatever they want. Um, there are no, uh, and this is, again, very complimentary to uh, the keynote, uh, Netflix is a very anti-process company. Um, so every team is essentially free to define what continuous delivery means to them. Um, if you remember, I introduced myself as the team building all the, uh, the, the platform to facilitate it. Teams don't have to use anything that my team writes. Um, but I assure you, every team at Netflix does use what we write. Uh, but it's their choice. I said we're largely a Java shop. That gave me that little asterisk, right? Um, any team at Netflix, is choose to write, they can choose to write things in Ruby, Perl, Python, you name it, Go. Uh, but the majority of teams choose Java because of, the, again, the, the infrastructure that's there to support, let's say, JVM-based languages, and the tooling there to support continuous delivery. But at the end of the day, Every team at Netflix is free to define what continuous delivery means to them and how they can use it. Um, one other thing there that's uh, implicit here, and I guess it's not implicit, it's 
explicit, is there are no operations teams at Netflix. Um, if you're a developer and you write, you know, you push some code uh, into some service and you push that service into production, you are on call. You are the one that gets the call at 3 a.m. when, you know, people in Europe can't watch Breaking Bad. Uh, if, if we're able to determine that was your service that broke down. There is a reliability team. It's a very small team. It's very lean. It's about 10 people. They constantly watch production and they're looking for um, errors and whatnot. We have a bunch of KPIs that uh, are key performance indicators or metrics that th this team monitors. And when, when it dips, uh, they'll quickly assess what's going on. And we have extensive monitoring, as, as you can well imagine, uh, in, in an environment like that. So we know at any given point if something's breaking. But that team doesn't fix it. That team picks up a phone, you know, picks up a phone and calls Andy or Stu to use the, uh, the keynote. You know, it calls Stu and says, your stuff's broken. You've got to fix it right now. Um, and that, that level of uh, responsibility uh, has some cultural benefits in that, um, you know, I said implicit and continuous delivery was that reliability aspect. Um, software engineers at Netflix are extremely prone to write a heck of a lot of tests and take uh, continuous delivery very seriously, that reliability aspect, because again, if you're the one who's on call at 3 a.m. and you don't want that call at 3 a.m., uh, you will ensure that your stuff gets out there in a reliable manner and you'll take advantage of the kind of the infrastructure that Netflix provides. So trust is a huge, I think, cultural component of continuous delivery. Let engineers make the decisions, treat people as adults, and they'll do the right thing for the company. And second is uh, this, this notion of uh, judgment. Judgments via insight. So as you can imagine, continuous delivery is a series of stages, right? As, as code is checked in, it goes through different processes or, 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 again, stages before it gets to some environment. Each stage is a quality gate that um, can be automated or manual if you choose. And there's a decision. Do I go forward or do I roll back? And you have to have intensive insight in that pipeline so that you know, either automation or humans can make those appropriate decisions on whether or not this, this piece of code should you know, continue out to our customers or we should roll it back and do something else. So continuous delivery, you got to have a lot of automation, but a lot of checks and balances and insight, operational insight into how something's moving through this pipeline and whether or not it should continue to move forward. And I'll share some of the insight things we've built to do that. So, I'm going to generalize how we do continuous delivery, but it's, you can largely summarize it in four steps. There's a, there's a build step, and I, and I will go into detail of each of these steps and the, and the tools we use. And I'll also I'll, I'll leave time at the end so you guys can ask me questions and whatnot. But there's a build step where things are uh, assembled. Uh, at the end of the day, um, the asset that we kind of move forward into production uh, because we leverage AWS, uh, how many people here are familiar with AWS? Okay, so pretty much all the room. Awesome. So uh, a, a machine image, an Amazon machine, machine image, Amazon calls it an AMI. Previous to joining Netflix, I called it an AMI. Uh, so I'll call it an AMI. Um, the, the, the end asset from a build process is an AMI. And that AMI then is pushed forward. So Implicit in the, in the latter three steps is a deployment. And the key thing about building the AMI here is going forward, that asset, that service, whatever it is that's going to spin up in, in, in these var various environments, has no dependencies. When it fires up, it doesn't need to make a call to download some jar from Maven Central or whatever it is. You can't, you know, X number of things. It's all done here. So once it goes into this pipeline, it, it, is, it is a self-contained uh, single entity instance that can be fired up in any region across the world and makes no dependencies on anything outside in the world that could be down at that time. And that's a key thing about reliability. Uh, you know, once, once we're done here, we can spin up an AMI, even if you know, GitHub or Maven Central or some Yum repository, what, you just name it. Any operational aspect that isn't available at that time, which is highly likely it will happen sometime, doesn't matter to us, we're good to go. So the verify step, is again, I talked about that reliability aspect, all the testing. Unit testing is a given, but once you get beyond unit testing, you gotta do a whole lot of testing. This is like integration style testing. Um, canary analysis, I will go into detail about this, but this is something Netflix, I think, kind of spearheaded. And this is the idea, and this is, 
it, it freaked me out when I, when I first got to Netflix, because having been the CTO at a, at a, at a different company, we, we wouldn't have dreamed of doing something like this. Um, but canary testing is, is, is spinning up an instance, you know, an AMI instance in, in production and allowing some traffic to go to it, trickle traffic. Maybe 1% of all you know, streaming requests go to this, this instance. And we're analyzing it. We're watching it. And, and it's not so much analyzing the code, but analyzing the machine and comparing it against a baseline. You know, is the machine behaving the same way it behaved in the last release, i.e. memory consumption? You name it. I'll get to more details there. So that's called automated canary analysis. Huge aspect for us to, to understand reliability. And then finally, it goes live. And again, that, that, that notion of live could be anywhere in the globe across various regions at Amazon. So the build process. How, how do we, uh, what is our build process? It's pretty simple. Developer checks in code. The code is built and is tested. Again, um, here we're leveraging Git, and we use Jenkins. Uh, Jenkins, I think, is pretty much the standard kind of continuous integration tool uh, across the world, although we are looking at other tools. We're always looking at you know, what's next. But um, a big part of that is, is the testing aspect. Testing phase is obviously here is unit testing. A lot of teams will also do kind of different analysis, you know, uh, static analysis like PMD or find bugs or something like that. Um, and then right after that, assuming all your tests pass, uh, we assemble that service into a Debian file. And then that Debian file is installed via something we call the bakery onto an AMI or you know, an, an, an Amazon you know, instance. And then it is baked, snapshotted. And then that AMI is then now our asset going forward. Has, remember, no dependencies on anything else in the globe. This thing is good to go. We can put it in any region in the world, fire it up, and we know it's going to fire up and be fine. Well, it'll fire up. Whether or not it be fine, is we'll find out in a little while. So far, so good. So uh, I didn't mention this. Uh, we are making, or maybe I did mention this, but because we're making Debian files, we are running on Ubuntu. Uh, Ubuntu is the standard uh, Netflix OS uh, going forward. We did used to use uh, CentOS. So previous to doing Debian files, we were doing RPMs. All right, verification. Um, how many people are familiar with the uh, Netflix kind of open source stack? Open sourced a whole lot of software. Not many. Awesome. Guess what? Netflix open sourced a whole lot of software to facilitate all this. I highly recommend you look at it. Go to GitHub Netflix OSS. Uh, one particular tool that we did uh, open source, um, and I will talk more about this as we talk about where we're going, uh, is a tool called Asgard. And what Asgard does is it, um, it takes that AMI and spins it up in any of uh, three regions across the world. Uh, and since everyone here is familiar with AWS, some details about AWS. The highest level construct in AWS is an auto-scaling group. So you have instances, and you can group those instances into auto-scaling groups. Um, that's great. It's fine and well. But uh, for Netflix, we saw that as kind of limiting. And we've added a model on top of that. So we have this notion of clusters. Clusters are a group of auto-scaling groups. Yes, a group of auto-scaling groups. A group of ASGs. Um, and then a group of clusters is, is grouped together into what we call an application. So we wrote a tool called Asgard that helps manage all that. So if you have a service out there, it's largely an application. That application then has various clusters that can be spread across the globe. Those clusters then can have various ASGs. And then those ASGs have various instances. And again, uh, I mentioned earlier that at any given point, there are thousands upon thousands of instances running across the globe. This is how we basically manage all that. So rather than dealing with individual instances, you're looking at essentially auto-scaling groups, or you're looking at clusters, or you're looking at the app itself. Again, we wrote that. We have a tool called Asgard that manages all that for us. However, we're in the process of replacing that tool with another one. And of course, once you then have copied this AMI you know, into the various regions of the globe, you spin it up, and then you run a, a series of uh, integration tests against it. So once, once more, you have this reliability aspect where we're you know, verifying does the code work like we think it should work once it's running up in an environment? So these are tests like, you know, again, these are uh, coding tests. Selenium, JUnit, Spock, you name it, all these things are being run or higher level tests against whatever service it is, again, to verify everything's working. Another thing we also have is we have multiple environments. 
So you can run these tests in a you know, simulated prod environment or a test environment staging. I think everyone here is well aware of different environments and, and familiar with this. We have the same concepts. All right, this is where it gets really interesting. So assuming that step is passed, everyone's happy, um, we've run all our functional tests, we'll deploy that AMI into a new cluster, and it's a canary cluster. And so what we call this is automated canary analysis, and there is a, an entire team at Netflix uh, who has built a series of tools that essentially can monitor your app in a production environment um, and, and monitor the app and the machine around it, and we save all that information, so we have baselines. So, you know, f let's say we have a service called Foo, and it's running in production, constantly monitoring it, and, and understanding the, the, you know, the average memory usage, uh, disk usage, CPU, CPU load, you name it, log growth, um, and that's a baseline. So you can use this tooling to essentially take this new AMI, throw it into this cluster, and then via load balancers, you can say, give me 1% of all traffic go specifically to this cluster. It could have multiple instances. And we'll sick this machine at it, or this, this, it's actually not a machine, but more like a, an entity, a being, um, Skynet. And it'll, uh, it'll watch this thing behave. And in some cases, you may choose to do this for a number of hours. It may take a couple hours to get that baseline. So this is, my, I, earlier I alluded to, it's got to be a rapid process. But some teams, it may take eight plus hours and whatnot. Uh, in this case, what they're doing is they're, they're again, shuffling a little traffic. So at any given point, you may not know it. When you fire up Netflix, your traffic may be going to some new instance. And this, this entity is just constantly watching it, gathering all the metrics. And essentially, you know, there's a nice big dashboard. And it's giving you a threshold and saying, um, things look good. Go ahead and just spin this up live. Or things are, something's weird here. The memory, you know, whatever it is, you name it. Some operational, uh, some operational aspect of this app is behaving differently than it did before. And this is all automated, and it'll just roll back. Or if you're, you, know, you set that threshold, maybe it's 90%. Or, again, it's, it's, it is a score at the end of the day. And if it's below the score, obviously, you're going to roll back. If it's above the score, you'll go forward. And so if you go forward, we have a very uh, kind of interesting way of going forward or you know, going 100% live. Um, we call it a red-black push. I believe the real world calls it blue-green. Yes, I was going to say black-green or something. But blue-green, but Netflix calls it red-black because previous to a couple months ago, our logo was red and black, but now it's not red and black. So maybe we'll call it uh, red and white. I don't know. But it's a red-black push. Um, and it's, it's a four-step you know, choreographed deployment. Uh, the next slides, I'll show you how it works. Um, but implicit here is that it's taking advantage of the cloud. Um, this, is, this, is, this is the beauty of the you know, elasticity of, of the cloud, whether it be AWS or Google or, or whatnot. Um, and it is, uh, most companies do what's called a rolling push. And red black is, rolling push is cheaper, right? Because it uses fewer resources. Red black push essentially doubles your, your capacity, right? In fact, let me show it to you. Um, and again, this is why you can pretty much get away with it in the cloud. It's kind of hard to do it in data centers. Although there is a gentleman, uh, Brian, later on talking about Docker. So if you're in a data center and you haven't looked at Docker, Docker can facilitate this kind of stuff, maybe potentially nicer. But so a red-black push is like this. You have a, uh, here's this AMI that we've burned, so to speak. We've baked. Um, and uh, it's live. It's version one. It's running out there. In this case, I'm going to talk about one AMI, but just imagine this is like 1,000 and it's running in an ASG or a cluster. And so what we do is we spin up version two right next to it. So this could either be, again, one instance or a whole other cluster of instances. And they're running side by side. And then we let a little traffic trickle to the new one. And again, we're still doing the automated canary analysis. That's pretty much going on all, at all times. And then we essentially turn off the old one. Not turn it off, I shouldn't say that. We turn off traffic to the old one. So now all, so at this point, traffic's going essentially, you know, it starts out 100, then it's 90, 10, 80, 20, and it's, it's, it's slowly doing that until at some point it's 100 and zero. 
And then this guy's the new one, and this guy can either be left, out there, you know, basically disabled, or completely destroyed. The beauty here is you can roll back instantly. Uh, the the, the anti-pattern that we solved or that the industry has solved with green, green blue-green, as opposed to rolling push, is this whole notion is you can always flip back, right? So in this case, if this guy all of a sudden just dies, you can quickly turn the load balancer and go back to here and you're good to go. This is all facilitated via that tool I mentioned earlier called Asgard. Uh, we had to write a whole lot of tooling to do all this. Um, and this is, this is how we deploy. This is the end of the line, so to speak. This is the end of continuous delivery, um, a pipeline for continuous delivery. So far, so good? All right. It's pretty simple stuff. OK. Challenges. What have we learned? It's not the easiest thing in the world uh, to get this far. Um, so first and foremost, um, I'm here to tell you we had to build it all, and we open sourced everything. So I highly recommend. Go look at our open source suite. Um, so when Netflix, four years ago, decided to go streaming, we were in a data center, like many of you. And uh, we knew that if we wanted to you know, seriously go global, we could no longer be constrained in a data center, so we elected to go to the cloud. To go to the cloud at that point was pretty darn early. And then to facilitate continuous delivery into the cloud was unheard of. And so we had to build a ton of stuff ton of tooling, tooling, frameworks, libraries. And we decided, you know what? Let's just open source it all. Because it's not, again, our competitive advantage is to move fast. But what differentiates us is the data. So all the stuff that we used and we wrote to move fast, we give away. So I highly recommend you take a look at this stuff. If, you, if, you know, if you're looking at going to the cloud and want to do continuous delivery, pretty much everything I've talked about today is open sourced or will be open sourced shortly. Uh, another reason for uh, open sourcing it all, of course, um, was uh, attracting talent. Uh, I, I'm actually fairly new to Netflix. I've been there almost a year, and I was well aware of you know, what Netflix was up to because I've been following them on the open source world. So uh, it certainly helps for uh, recruiting. If you aren't open sourcing anything that your business, if you have something that's not business critical, is not like your special sauce, I'd highly recommend open sourcing it. It attracts amazing talent. Second uh, challenge and lesson learned um, is not all tests are created equal. I can't stress testing at all levels. Unit tests are phenomenal or great. I couldn't imagine writing code without writing unit tests, but uh, they fall short of simulating what life is like in the real world. Um, so uh, this shouldn't be kind of news to anybody, but testing at all levels is very, very important, and especially in a, you know, continuous delivery environment where you, have, you don't have the luxury of downtime or telling customers to come back in three hours while we do this deployment. Um, you need to have a heck of a lot of functional style testing. And that's that. And, and you know, automated canary analysis in many ways is, is, is a, higher level level of a, a higher level of testing that I would include like beyond functional. And it requires a significant investment. Uh, writing tests, tests are not cheap. They have to be maintained. Uh, well, they have to be written, too. Um, and they, they break. And when they break, you have to fix them. So don't, don't overlook the, uh, the, the investment in the testing. Uh, a lot of people tend to do that, unfortunately. All right. Results. What have we learned? What can you learn from us? Well, first and foremost, Continuous delivery works. It is the cornerstone of all business initiatives at Netflix. It, it is an unquestionable, sacred thing at Netflix. If, you, if you're a team at Netflix that for some reason elects not to do continuous delivery, it would never happen, actually. But um, it, it is just essentially assumed by the business. I've worked at companies where you know, the business would come out and say, OK, we want to get this feature out there, and we'd work with, you know, they'd work with you know, me and my team, and we'd be like, all right, it might be two weeks. We'll get it out there in the next release. At Netflix, business says, hey, we want to make this change. Teams at Netflix are like, all right, do you want it today? We can, you know, we'll push this. It may take a developer a couple hours to do it, and it'll be in production later on this afternoon. Are you cool with that? Um, that's a phenomenal. Uh, I think difference or a, a differentiator for IT um, to be able to go back to the business and say, yeah, no problem. Whatever you want, you'll get immediately. Um, 
to put it into perspective, you know, we've been doing continuous delivery for, again, roughly four years. Um, I'm new to the company. I was brought in about, like I said, a year ago. The name of my team is uh, Delivery Engineering. Uh, Netflix, uh, I've built a team of seven individuals, so there's eight of us um, building the next generation continuous delivery platform at Netflix. That's how serious the company takes it, that they've, they've gone out and hired eight of us and said, we love continuous delivery. It's working really well for us, but we want it to work even better. So please go off and make it work better. I think that's a testament to how the business you know, views the benefits of continuous delivery. Again, moving fast is a competitive advantage. Don't overlook that. It's not a startup uh, concern either. Um, there's, a, there's a famous quote, and I shouldn't say famous. There's a phenomenal quote from the CIO of Walmart. Walmart's the number one largest company on the planet. Uh, Fortune 500 number one this year and last year. He's quoted as saying, the only differentiation for a company is speed. And I think that's fascinating that Walmart would say that. Um, you know, is we, we tend to think of speed as like, oh, it's a startup thing. Twitter, no, Twitter's not a startup anymore, but you know. Uh, but it, it doesn't matter. Regardless of you know, the size of your company, moving fast is a competitive advantage. And continuous delivery enables you to do that. And continuous delivery doesn't necessarily mean every change goes into production, but what it means is any change can go to production. And you know, largely it's it's again it's the ethos of our culture. Again, um, you know, kind of piggybacking on uh, Michael's keynote. Uh, in order for us to survive and continue to be the number one streaming video you know, content provider on the internet, we have to continually innovate. If we ever sit down and rest on our laurels, someone's going to come along and you know, crush us like has happened infinity times <laughs> in, the, uh, in the tech world. So moving fast, it's just part, it's, 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 you know, it's ingrained in the culture. Um, another thing that's really special, I think, about Netflix is, um, you know, I told you about freedom and responsibility, but also uh, the, the, you are free to fail. There is, there's no problem, um, there's no kind of like finger pointing or you know, firings if you, know, you, you push something so fast out there and it breaks. While we put a bunch of stuff to make sure it doesn't break, it's okay if it does. Because again, the, the impetus is if it breaks, fix it real fast. And let's learn from it. So you know, moving fast, continuous delivery, constant innovation is, is again, it's, it's, it's part of our culture. I think it needs to be a part of any culture if you want to embrace this style of you know, software delivery. OK. Now I want to share with you three things we've learned. And we've definitely made mistakes. And you're going to need these three things um, if you wish to go forward. So first thing, global deployments require like detailed insight into metrics. Um, in our case, they're core metrics. If you don't have detailed monitoring in your environment, um, you know, start there. But then you have to figure out what are the actual metrics that actually matter to you in the business, or really to the business, because you should be one and the same. Um, in Netflix's case, our core metric is streaming starts per second, SPS. We watch this like a hawk. And at any given point, if SPS dips in any region, at any time of the day, People are alerted immediately. That's, that is our core metric, because we know over time um, it's, well, well what, it's 11 o'clock here. So East Europe right now is, is watching a lot of Netflix. Um, so SPS is on the rise. If you see a dip, we know instantly something's wrong in the European region. Same thing on the East Coast. We watch the East Coast like a hawk, and we watch the West Coast. And so continuous delivery feeds into that, right? Because if Europe right now is you know, in the middle of you know, watching Breaking Bad or whatever it is, a team can elect, let's not do a deployment right now. So continuous delivery requires, one, that you have core metrics, and then the ability to schedule things based on those metrics. Initially, Netflix, when we made a change, we pushed it across the globe instantly. Makes a lot of sense if you're on the West Coast. This is a great time to deploy on the West Coast. No one's doing anything on the West Coast. We're still all asleep, basically, and wearing flip flops. Um, but you know, like I said, Europe probably starting to watch a lot of TV right now because they're getting home from work, and that's that moment of relaxation where we really want the experience to be phenomenal. Because again, if you go to Netflix and you're really happy, 
you'll probably sign up next month or whatever or tell your friends about it. But if you get home from work, you've had a hard day, you try to watch Breaking Bad, and it, you, know, you get that buffering error all the time, you're going to be like, screw this, I'm going to try something else. So our continuous delivery processes enable scheduling based on these core metrics. So at peak viewing times, unless it's a critical bug fix, many teams elect, let's not deploy this thing into Europe right now. We'll do it into you know, the West Coast. We'll do it on the East Coast. And then when peak time starts dipping in Europe, then we'll do this deployment in Europe. Not all teams do this, but some of the critical ones do this, or choose to do this. So understand your core metrics. Watch them like a hawk. Leverage them for continuous delivery. Next, this is a don't forget about the cloud. Use the cloud what it's made for, and that's elasticity. The cloud, um, by and large, has infinite resources, although I, I'm here to tell you that Netflix regularly finds out where those infinite things stop. <laughs> AWS is uh, elastic. Now, for most, for most businesses, AWS is truly elastic. Um, don't forget about that. Uh, one thing that Netflix, uh, and this will be interesting because, the, again, uh, Brian is talking about Docker, and I think Docker's fascinating, and Docker is something Netflix is keeping an eye on looking at very closely. But um, one thing that we've done, and we think it's a lesson learned and, and something I, would, I wish to impart with you all, is that uh, we, we view an instance in the cloud as an ephemeral you know, thing that you know, spins up, it's got our code on it, and it could die at any moment. We don't care about that. In fact, we regularly shoot instances in the head just to make sure that we're prepared to, uh, to survive an outage. And that, again, is taking advantage of the cloud. Uh, a lot of, in fact, the company I was at before this, where we had a, a heck of a lot of load, um, we would try to like, squeeze everything out of an instance. So we'd put like, multiple apps on an instance, so we'd fire up you know, this M3X large, and we put like six apps on it, and we were like, yes, we're saving money because we, are, we have one machine with six things on it, um, which is fine. Problem is, is that like when you know, the third instance, or not the third instance, but the third app on that dies, you've got to actually go to that thing, you know, SSH to it, and be like, why did it die? And then you know, kick it back up because you don't want to mess with the other whatever, five apps. Netflix's mantra, you put one app on an instance, because again, elasticity, there's infinite amount of instances we can spin up. If that thing falls over, who cares? Shoot it in the head and spin up a new one. And in fact, production uh, SSH is largely never used. No one really ever SSH to a production machine. You just shoot it in the head and fire a new one up. Now, if it continues to keep dying, then maybe someone will SSH to it and figure out what's going on. But so take advantage of the cloud. The true elasticity of the cloud is, uh, is phenomenal. Spin up resources and then tear them down as needed. Single tenancy works really, really well in this model. Obviously, in a data center, you're constrained. You don't really have truly elasticity or true elasticity, so something like Docker may help. Um, I think the Docker equation in the cloud gets really, really interesting um, and kind of muddy. But I will say right now, in the Netflix view of the world, single tenancy works phenomenally well. Also note, since everyone here rose their hand for AWS, uh, pricing at AWS is linear. So, um, if you want to squeeze six apps onto, let's say, a six gig machine, you could actually get six machines, or let's, let's make the math easier. Two apps on a six gig machine is this roughly the same cost as two machines with three gigs. Now, it's not always true with like CPUs and whatnot at Amazon, but the pricing model is linear, so just keep that in mind. Finally, I forgot when we end. 115, oh, sweet. Um, this is where we're going. This is a lesson we've learned, um, and it's version all the things. Okay, so what do I mean by that? I told you that uh, from an automation standpoint, we have Gradle, or just think of a build file, regardless of the technology you use. Um, we have a build file that delineates you know, how your software is or how your project is, is compiled, tested, and packaged. And then we have these other tools like Asgard I mentioned. Um, and automated canary analysis. There's all these other tools in the pipeline that actually have um, information about your app and what it should do. If you think about that, that, um, that source of truth is spread across multiple you know, instances. You have three sources of truth in that example. You have your build file, you have Asgard, and you have this other thing called automated canary analysis. The problem is, is that 
anyone can change that source of truth and not necessarily know about it. And in fact, you could go into Asgard and say, my particular app now needs, it's got 200 instances. Uh, I'm going to bump it up to 300. What we've discovered is that that's, that's really, that's fine and well. That's great. People can do that, and people do that all the time. Problem is, is we lose the history of that. We don't know why you went to 300. We have an event that we know it went to 300, but we don't know um, why you did that. But think about it. If you were to go into your build file or into your code and you changed you know, 200 to 300, you would commit it to Git or whatever, Perforce, CVS. You'd probably leave a commit message, right, saying, you know, need to go to 300 because we've noticed that this thing falls over at 9 p.m. Um, so what we're doing is largely collapsing that model of what it means to be you know, deployed across the cloud, what it means to be analyzed in a production environment, and folding that into essentially our build file. And so that becomes a single point of truth, a single, single entity that defines how this app is realized in production. And think about it. It, it's, 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 it may sound kind of weird, but it's no different than your build file, right? Your build file says how your code should be deployed. So why not, or not deployed, how it should be compiled. Um, why not add all the other information there, like it should look like this in production. It should have this many instances. It should have this kind of load balancer in front of it. It should be running on this type of instance. Um, it should have these thresholds when you do an automated canary analysis in that. And all that is stored in one place that engineers can go to and version. And when you make changes to it, everyone knows why. The threshold for automated canary analysis used to be, let's say, 700. We've now lowered it to 650. We have a record of who did it and when and why. This is very important. So if you, again, from a continuous delivery standpoint, you're going to end up stitching together various systems. And each system will have its own source of truth. That'll become somewhat of a, a maintenance nightmare as you grow and new people come on, people leave, people are going to lose track of why we made a decision in that, you know, that upstream system. So we're moving kind of, again, that source of truth down to one place. And then those upstream systems will use that place to determine, OK, what am I supposed to do here? Immutable environments is kind of a, a hot kind of DevOps term these days. And this is largely you know, in line with that notion. So version all the things. So last but not least, um, I did try to leave uh, a couple minutes for question, questions. Uh, that's my contact information. Um, thank you very much for your time. I hope I imparted some nugget of truth, or not truth, well, definitely truth. Lots of nuggets of truth. Hopefully something you can take back to your company, companies. Thank you. There's got to be some questions. Come on. I'll help you. Uh, for the, the verify stage, um, how, like, and on the topic of versions, how does, where do you get the tests for that particular version of that Amy? Amy, sorry. So the tests are, are part of the code base? So and they're, they're, in, they're in Git somewhere? Yes, they're part of the code base. And then Jenkins and other uh, kind of like, uh, like Mesos, those type of tools, are then running those tests against the AMI in that cluster. And are, are they versioned together separately? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, definitely. How do you manage uh, compatibility between components across the, uh, the sort of deployment boundary? Components like services? Uh, service interfaces, yeah. data storage, the whole thing. Yeah, so, um, well, data storage, at the end of the day, Netflix le leverages Cassandra. Um, and you go through a series of services to actually you know, get data in and out. Uh, the larger issue is service contracts between, you know, like I said, Netflix is a SOA. Um, how we've solved it up to now is uh, every team provides a client jar, essentially. Uh, so a binary that, OK, so I have the service foo, and you need to make use of foo. So you come to me and you say, let me have um, your client library so I can talk to you. So every team is binarily kind of independent, and they can, they can run together, you know, run at separate uh, paces. And, and the contract is through that, you know, that, that client library. That works, but um, it, it's, it's being kind of reevaluated. Um, you know, the, without client libraries, then you're, you're stuck with like, you know, the, the the URL, right? The RESTful interface, and people try to version those. But then the payload could change. You know, I'll change this JSON, blah, blah, blah. Um, and that, that's not where we're going. But what we found is that those client jars uh, tend to introduce a whole lot of other dependencies that then can break. You know, so if, 
if you're Foo and I'm Bar and I give you my client jar that has a different version of some library that you depend on, it can mess you up. So um, we're building some tools to understand kind of the dependency analysis between services. So it's, that's how we do it. I'm not saying it's foolproof, but it, it, it largely works. Um, so where does uh, QA fit into all of this? Uh, with the, the huge robust uh, testing suite, where, where does like human QA actually fit into this? They don't. <laughs> so let me explain. Uh, uh, the client side teams, like, uh, like I'm pointing here, like there's, there's a Netflix box there, sorry. Uh, so the Netflix interface, like uh, devices, your iPad or your computer or your Xbox, those have QA teams. Um, and they're regularly basically, that's probably the best job in the world. They watch Netflix all day. Um, and they're watching Netflix in these various environments. But um, those are the only teams that have QA. There is no formal QA on any of the engineering, like basically server side, all the services that are published. And there's roughly um, more than 600 services running in production and not one of them has a QA team that QAs it, it's all engineers. You, again, are responsible for what goes in production. Um, it, it, and, the, and the belief is, is that if someone else, if, like, if I'm an engineer and I throw it over the fence and give it to QA, then you know, there's this, remember he said something like uh, people are motivated? You know, um, I, f I forget his quote, but essentially you'll do changes or you'll make changes depending on how you're motivated. And that's the, the belief. If, if I know that what I write today will be in production in a couple hours, I'm gonna make real, uh, sure that what I wrote works really well. I'm going to test the bejesus out of it because, again, I don't want to get that call at 3 a.m. Um, so there are really no QA teams at Netflix per se. There is a client-side QA team. And again, because you can't automate a lot of that stuff, like you just gotta, someone's got to sit down and actually watch, you know, do a search and watch and make sure Breaking Bad, you know, goes from end to start to end, excuse me. If you haven't... Yes, I really love Breaking Bad. <laughs> Probably should say like House of Cards or something, but yeah. Hey, so I was wondering um, if, if Netflix is going to put out like a new service or something, like, hey, let's show a montage of all the videos you've watched over the year or something. Like, how do you establish a baseline for something that doesn't exist? You know, how, do you, how does the canary testing work for yeah. something that's new? that's great. Um, we, we basically wing it. Uh, a team will wing it and just basically say, all right, we think this is what the, the baseline is, and we'll, we'll put it out there in production and find out real quick. Um, so you're right. Uh, the, the, you largely guess what the baseline is, especially with automated canary analysis. Now, there's a lot of institutional knowledge at Netflix that understands basically the type of app you're building, how much load it's going to get. I mean, again, we watch our metrics like, like hawks, so we know that if you spin up a service you know, at this time in this region, you should expect about this much load. Um, so you can largely guess it, uh, and then you watch it like a hawk going forward and you, you, know, you refine it. Um, there is a performance team at Netflix that uh, essentially acts as like consultants and they'll sit down with teams. Um, because again, at the end of the day, you know, engineers at Netflix are like super awesome at building you know, a service that whatever you know, fires up you know, you know, My Little Pony quickly on your iPad, um, but may not understand the implications of you know, the performance of an iPad or the servers that you know, it's, it's coming off of. So, that's where that performance team can kind of help in a consultative basis. And they'll, help you lar they'll largely help you define those initial thresholds. One more question. Sorry, I missed you guys. Is your CD system in the cloud too? <laughs> um, no. So uh, the DVD, is, oh, CD system, I'm sorry. Uh, continuous delivery, yes, of course, yes. Um, I, I'm sorry, I thought you meant CD as in DVD. Uh, no, our continuous delivery system does, uh, it, it, the platform is in the cloud. Um, like I said, right now it's, it's a series of tools. Um, one of them is open source called Asgard. We are rebuilding that. Um, and that, that, that tool or that platform is called Spinnaker. It is completely in the cloud. It is completely dog fooded. So we use Spinnaker to basically continuous deploy Spinnaker. And all the teams at Netflix are using Spinnaker to continuous deploy. But yeah, it definitely leverages the cloud. We're, Netflix is essentially 100% in the cloud. Yes, he said, I'm done. Crane, or whatever. Thank you very much. <laughs>